Guess where we are today? Yes! Secure Ninja. So I am super excited to be here in Mountain View, California. I am at the Computer History Museum and I am with Doug Spicer. He is the senior curator here at the museum. How are you today? I'm great, thanks. Excellent, thank you so much for having us here and giving us this personalized tour. Oh, my pleasure. It's gonna be yeah. amazing. We've been here before, but mm -hmm. just as you know, regular attendees. So we're super right. excited to get the inside scoop on all of the history of computers. Great, well let's go have a look. Absolutely, I'll follow you. Hi Alicia, we're here at the Computer History Museum in the Revolution exhibit, okay. and we're gonna start by looking at punch cards. Awesome, punch cards are the beginning of everything, I understand. They are, in terms of computing. The story of punch cards begins in about 1890 when the federal government was about to prepare for the 1890 census. They had just finished the 1881, so they were in big trouble because there were millions of new immigrants and a lot more questions. Right. So they needed a kind of mechanized method of doing the census, that is counting every person in the United States. Right. So what they would do is uh, go out in the field and ask questions. Here's a typical um, census taker asking oh, wow. a farmer about uh, various things about his farm, how many cows do you have, how many acres are planted, all those kind of things. The census taker takes his handwritten notes and brings them to the office where a clerk then brings it to this machine called a pantograph which encodes his handwritten notes into holes in a punch card. So if you look at the top surface of this pantograph, you can see it has the same questions like how many dairy cattle do you have, okay. how much wheat, how much corn. And so the census taker's answers are punched into patterns in this card. The conceptual breakthrough behind that is that it's now in machine readable form. Right. Before it was only in human readable form. Right. Okay, so let's look at the solution. A young German-American engineer called Hermann Hollerith, this fellow here in the top hat, mm -hmm. um, as you can see he's only 24 but he's already dressed very well, so he was quite successful. He came up with this device called the Hollerith census machine. Basically, you put the punch card inside this little waffle iron kind of thing, and you'll notice that there are steel rods that poke up and down through this. They're on little springs. Inside these holes are discrete cups of mercury. So the cups of mercury are actually wired to these little counters on the top. So wherever there's a hole in the card, when you close the press like this, Wherever there's a hole in the card, a contact closure is made and the corresponding counter kicks over one position. They were able to do the census in three years this way right. instead of 10. So it was a major innovation. Absolutely. Hollerith's patents are important for another reason. They were the foundation for IBM. So IBM bought all of his patents and created basically for the next 100 years machines based on Hollerith cards. Excellent. That is interesting. I know I like this. Nothing stimulates creativity like a good crisis. So that's what this was. Right. Yeah, awesome. it really was. And then from there? Well, some people have asked, you know, well, where did Hollerith get his ideas for this? The answer to the origin of the punch card lies in weaving in the French city of Lyon, where in the 18th century, a French inventor called Jean-Marie Jacquard came up with a series of cards to control looms. But let's go over and have a look at those. These cards actually controlled whether a thread was uh, woven or not. So if there was a hole there, the thread would go through. If it wasn't, um, there would be no thread there. You're able to do really complex patterns with these uh, strips of punch cards. And here's uh, actually a loom up here that shows you the program. It's really the software uh, that is con coordinating the loom into making those patterns. And I understand this is a binary system, essentially. Absolutely, it only has two states. There's either a hole or no hole. And if you just look a little bit to your right here, you can see a typical pattern created by a Jacquard loom. So created by that program encoded on punch cards that Jacquard made, you get incredibly elaborate patterns. Right. Now one of the- replicated too. This is the, the first way that they could actually remake something again and again. Right? Exactly, and one of the, probably the first instance of software piracy was actually a, uh, competitive, uh, you know, your competition, other weavers breaking into your factory at night and stealing your deck <laughs> right? of Jacquard loom cards oh um, because these were gold. They, they were uh, created at great expense. You had to have people using pencil and paper and encoding, going from a drawing of the pattern they wanted, right. translating that into a series of 
um, loom motions right. controlled by these punch cards. So the encoding process itself is fairly complicated. So it, there's a lot of money invested in this. And of course the patterns, just like today, are very, uh, can be very trendy and valuable depending right. on the current, you know, if this pattern is really in this season, right. then everybody will be trying to produce goods that look like that. Right, wow, that's interesting. Software piracy <laughs> in the form of stealing these cardboard cards? Is that what they're made Yeah, they're cards? basically cardboard. Cardboard, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, well now we're in the real-time computing gallery of Revolution. This is a gallery that has computers that act immediately. If they don't, something bad happens. So you'll okay. notice that we have also in this gallery an, uh, a display of anti-lock braking and pacemakers. What we have behind us here is one of the largest real-time computer systems ever designed. It was called SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. And it was created, basically the system came online in 1961. It took uh, about five or six years, began in the late 50s. This was a continental-wide air defense system that was supposed to protect America from incoming Soviet bombers. That was the threat in the late 1950s and early 60s. Yes. You can see the console here, one of about a hundred that different airmen would sit in front of looking at the airspace above their region, looking for incoming UFOs, basically right. things that should not be there. Right. They had all the normal air traffic routes like from United and Delta and so on built in so they knew which flights okay. were supposed to be there right. so they could tell what were the exceptions. Um, this also had a light gun which let them uh, kind of as a precursor to the light pen. They would point at an object on the screen and um, that would give them options. Uh, it would pr pr present a little menu of options that they could then uh, you know, either designate that target or, or right. do various actions on it. Excellent. So they would just sit here and kind of watch out for things. I see there's a cigarette ashtray and lighter. <laughs> That's right, the ashtray and cigarette lighter, because in the 60s, cigarettes didn't cause cancer, as right, we all know. Right, exactly. Um, well, it's very 60s of it. <laughs> it kind of gives you an idea of the environment there. Um, you know, people describe it as hours and hours of sheer boredom, punctuated by right. moments of total terror. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> why the total terror? Because sometimes, this happened in, at least twice that I know of, um, in one case, there was a flock of birds flying over Newfoundland that the system thought was an incoming uh, oh uh, cohort of Soviet bombers. Right. Uh, they figured that out pretty quickly, but they did scramble uh, jets. Wow. As a, and then the other instance was when someone left a training tape on the SAGE system, one that simulated an all-out attack. Oh, no. And they just caught that at the last moment before. Uh, right. They were watching it going, oh my gosh, this is happening, when really it was... Exactly. Oh, no. Exactly. So <laughs> SAGE is a bit controversial. Um, IBM was the prime contractor. The U.S. Air Force was uh, basically the customer. And uh, IBM made huge amounts of money on this, on this project, and it really helped their bottom line. Some critics suggest that the SAGE system was out of date by the time it came online uh -huh. because the threat, remember, was to counter bombers. Mm -hmm. Well, by, not, by the early 60s, the threat had changed to ICBMs. Uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles right. which fly 10 or 20 times faster than a bomber and so this system would not have been able to keep up. Right. In a way, you know, we call it a 1960s era Star Wars system uh -huh. because the idea was to create a shield over the continental United States, right. an impenetrable shield. Right. Um, the right. other attempts like Star Wars and then the national uh, uh, George Bush's version of that um, also you know, had, were fraught with technical issues. Most scientists, for example, said Star Wars would, couldn't possibly work. At right. the time, in the height of the Cold War, when this was made, people just wanted to be seen to be doing something uh, wow. to protect America from the Russians. Right. And this was largely an outgrowth of that. You know, it cost eight to ten billion dollars, more than the Manhattan Project. So that gives you an idea of how important SAGE was. And yet, it's almost invisible to history. Very oh, few people know about it. Interesting. Well, I guess in technology, sometimes you have to fail in order to make things better. You do, and you know, at somewhat at taxpayers' expense. But I'll tell you, yeah. some great technological spin-offs came from this. Modems, real-time computing, um, using multiple users at once on a system. Uh, extreme reliability. Sage was down something like an hour a year, which is unbelievable because it's made with vacuum tubes not transistors. And vacuum tubes are not particularly reliable, but they actually had twin CPUs. 
okay. known as a duplex arrangement, right. where if one CPU failed or they needed to take it down for maintenance, the other one would kick in. Excellent. The final fact I want to leave you with about why Sage is so significant is that at the height of the project, 60% of all American programmers were working on Sage. There you go. This is the gallery where we get to see some of the most significant computers of all time. What we have right here is the IBM System 360. It was announced in 1964 on April 7th, the same day that the Ford Mustang was introduced. 360 is really important for a number of reasons. One, it had a phenomenal architecture, that is the conceptual block level uh, diagram for the machine and the way that the software worked was extremely well thought out. It's so well thought out, in fact, that programs written in 1964 can still run on the current generation of IBM mainframe. Really? Yes, the so-called Z series. Uh -huh. The beautiful thing about 360 was when it came out, there were five different models. So depending on how big a business you were, you could find a 360 for you. And if your business grew, you could just move up to the next more powerful model of 360. Okay. The reason that's significant is that before then, um, you had to rewrite software for every new computer you did. With oh, 360, really? all five models ran the same software. Right. So you kept your software investment, and that was a massive uh, improvement over what happened before. Before 360, if you called IBM for a computer, you would get up to seven different salesmen calling you, each representing a different product line within IBM. Wow. So 360 was a response not only to a market demand for a family of computers that could expand and contract but still run all the same software. It was also a reaction to an internal crisis at IBM in which they just couldn't support seven different product lines anymore. They right. were stepping all over each other. Right. So 360 is still with us, as I said, with current Z series mainframes from IBM. Um, companies that were, are very large and that wrote code back in the 60s or 70s uh -huh. are still running that same legacy code for the most part. It's just too expensive or too time consuming to recode it. Um, and there's too much writing on it. So these are huge multi-billion dollar businesses right. like uh, insurance companies and banks and so on. So what exactly is the actual operating system that this thing is running? Great question. IBM produced many operating systems, probably a dozen over the lifetime of System 360 and, and its follow on System 370. Okay. The first one came out was called OS 360 and it was universally panned. In fact, the lead architect for it, Fred Brooks, who's a professor at, North, at uh, UNC, wrote a famous book that, computer, uh, that software people uh, know about. It's called The Mythical Man Month. And basically his point is that if you have a late software project, adding more people to the project just makes it later. Uh -huh. It doesn't help you move things along more quickly. Mythical Man Month, that makes sense. Right, so one of the canonical uh, uh, memes about programming came from System 360 and right. specifically OS 360. Excellent. So that was a fail, the OS 360? Pretty much. Right? And people used it, but they were very unhappy. Right. Yeah. And then they moved on from there and just kept creating different, entirely different pieces or entire, entirely different operating systems or different versions of 360? No, different operating systems. Okay. Operating systems that added functionality to it, like for example, uh, being able to support disk drives mm -hmm. or um, um, having faster mathematical abilities, like right. having special uh, software to handle math functions, right. things like that. Cool. Also, virtual memory was another big addition. The ability to use a hard disk as a form of memory, right. uh, not storage, right. was a big addition to uh, IBM operating systems. Excellent. And then speaking of hard disks, you had one over here right. that I thought should be large enough to carry 300,000 terabytes of data, right? Well, maybe if you use current technology, yeah, today. But what we have here is a, really the world's first disk drive. It was made in 1956 at IBM in San Jose. Okay. And it uh, holds 3.4 million characters. They're six-bit characters, so we don't talk about bytes in this particular case. But it's essentially uh, about the length of an MP3 song, uh -huh. or which is an unfair comparison because they weren't using it for that. Right. The real way to look at it is to see that it replaced tens of thousands of punch cards, maybe 50 or 60,000 punch cards, right. which was a real uh, breakthrough at the time. The reason is that with punch cards, you have to sequentially sort to find the information you're looking for. Right. You have to go through every single card, like you're looking at a card catalog, literally, uh -huh. at, at the library. Um, whereas with a hard disk, you go immediately to the information. 
and it, and it pulls it for you. Nice. This allowed real-time computing uh, and transaction processing to occur. So businesses before this would usually run a batch job at the end of the day or the end of the week to get a snapshot of their business. You know, what are sales, what are inventory, salaries, all that kind of stuff. Right. But using a hard drive, you can get those results immediately. Nice. You know, you can see right now, how many shoes do I have in, in stock, right? Excellent. Uh, yeah, those kind of things. Excellent. So this, of course, is the start of the hard drive industry we know today, which is uh, a phenomenal yeah. industry and has grown, in fact, faster than the rate of Moore's Law, okay. which is not well known. The storage capacity of disk drives has actually increased faster than the transistor density predicted by Moore's Law. So okay. storage gets kind of short shrift, but it's obviously extremely important oh, to all of us. Extremely important. I mean, we shoot video, and you know, we've got now these micro SD cards, and even just in, in my lifetime, thinking back of what it took to store a certain amount of data, it just gets smaller and smaller, but I guess the catch is that our data gets bigger and bigger, and then you need you know, more on one little piece. Well, that's right, and then you know, <laughs> there's a part that we explore here a little bit in, in our display called the Digital Dark Age, which talks about hey, we're creating all of our content now where we used to write letters and take pictures and put them in albums and stuff. Right. You could forget about them for 50 years and they would still be accessible. Yeah. You know, Granny's photo album she left in the attic, you can still open it and look at them. Yeah. Now we're creating everything digitally. Right. So digital objects have a finite lifespan, at least the, the, the technologies that store those objects have a finite lifespan, right. like hard disks or floppies or CDs, whatever you want to use. This little movie behind us called The Digital Dark Age asks the question, what's going to happen to our, our heritage, our digital memories, wow. if we don't take active steps, all of us, individually, to protect and Move migrate it. our, migrate. our um, asset, digital assets every so, every so often to a new storage system so before the old one fails. Right. So the idea of benign neglect, which you had before, where you could just leave photos in a drawer yeah. for 50 years, can't do that anymore. Right. So we've, we're paying a cost. Wasn't that amazing? In fact, we filmed so much awesome content that we couldn't even fit it all into one episode. So make sure you check out part two. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm Alicia Webb. Thanks for watching. Bye.